Oxyfuel processes such as heating, cutting, brazing, and welding create a potential danger from flames, sparks, and intense heat. Despite these hazards, millions of people work accident-free every year. By design, manufacturers build safe equipment. This decreases the likelihood of a potential incident. However, good oxyfuel operators know that their own safety, as well as the safety of those around them, depends on proper and responsible use of oxyfuel equipment. This video will help you learn more about oxyfuel technology, equipment, operation, and safety principles. To explain these fundamentals are Ken Heinrichs, a welding and metal fabrication instructor, and Tim Taylor, a welding and cutting expert. Ken, with all the people in the workplace, whose responsibility is it for safety? It's not about what you're doing or what your official job title is. Just remember, safety is everyone's responsibility. And I agree 100%. It's yeah. everyone's responsibility. Victor has gathered additional material to support this video. When you see this torch tip icon, look for additional training material on this DVD, as well as in your training kit. Now let's get started. The four most common oxyfuel processes are cutting, heating, welding, and brazing. The technology fundamentals and safety principles apply equally to each of these processes. The foundation for all oxyfuel processes is commonly called the triangle of combustion or fire triangle. Combustion requires three elements, fuel, oxygen, and heat. It's your responsibility to control each of these elements. Now, here's our first safety tip. Good housekeeping is important. Ken, will you tell us a little bit about good housekeeping? Good housekeeping simply means keeping your work area free of combustible materials. Items such as oily rags, paper, flammable liquids, and trash cans need to be removed from the area. Remember, you're going to have sparks and those sparks can hit anything in your work area. What about smoking? Tim, it should go without saying that there's no smoking around cylinders, but it needs to be reinforced. Also, never use matches or lighter to light the torch. The only approved tool for lighting a torch is the spark lighter. Tim, can you tell us some of the obvious hazards associated with oxyfuel cutting and heating? Sure. Um, of course, the most obvious is the flame itself and the sparks it produces. However, it also will produce a small amount of infrared rays. Mm. And we, not, we must protect our eyes as well as our skin. Mm -hmm. Now, let's start with eyewear. I prefer a face shield with a shaded lens. However, mm -hmm. if you do use this, make sure that you use the appropriate safety glasses underneath. Mm -hmm. You can use goggles. Or I know, Ken, you prefer this, the, the yeah. safety glasses. That's right. Um, anyone is fine. What else do we need, Ken? What else should I be looking for? Well, you definitely need to wear the appropriate gloves and clothing. In fact, the clothing I recommend you wear are a pair of blue jeans and a denim shirt. Cotton duck material is also OK. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, in addition to wearing those, what I like to wear is a lab coat or a welding jacket. But you need to be sure to button up the collar of your shirt as well as the sleeves. And for obvious reasons, you never keep paper in your pocket while using a torch. And you never roll up the sleeves of your shirt or cuff your pant legs as they provide a perfect area to catch sparks and slag. What about boots? When it comes to shoes, you can't beat a good pair of leather boots. But Tim, whatever you do, don't wear boots made from synthetic material, as molten metal will burn right through them. That's a good point, Ken. And you know there's a lot of companies that won't allow you in the door without a good pair of leather steel-toed boots. That's right. Wherever and whenever you work, remember these safety fundamentals. Understand the triangle of combustion. Keep your work area clean. Always use proper personal protective equipment. Wear appropriate clothing. If you work in your street clothes, choose tightly woven fabrics made from natural fibers. Wool is naturally flame retardant, but never wear polyester fleece or other flammable synthetics. Lastly, make sure appropriate fire extinguishing equipment is easily accessible and that you know how to use it. Depending on where you work, 
there may be additional safety requirements, so check with your safety manager or supervisor. Everyone knows what a cylinder is, but do you know how to properly identify, handle, and place a cylinder in your work area? Let's start with identification. A common mistake is to assume a cylinder color indicates a specific gas. Tim, there really aren't any standards when it comes to a cylinder's color, are there? Uh, you're right, there isn't. Unfortunately, there's not. A uh, distributor or gas supplier can paint his cylinders any color he wants, simply mm. for identification. Good example is we have an acetylene here that's green and an oxygen that's orange. It could just as easily be black and red. Mm. It really doesn't make any difference. Mm. We want to make sure that we don't try to identify the contents by the color of the cylinder. In fact, to identify a cylinder's contents, just read the label. And if there's not a label on your cylinder, don't use it you need to contact your gas supplier and ask him to take it back. Cylinders also have a United Nations or UN gas identification marking on their label. Here are some common UN ID numbers. You'll also find these in section 14, transport information of material safety data sheet. Careless handling can turn a gas cylinder into a projectile. Whenever you handle a cylinder, keep these five fundamentals in mind. Before moving a cylinder, install the cylinder cap, if there is one. Use a cart designed to transport cylinders. Place cylinders in a safe location where they're protected from sparks, flames, and heat sources. Don't block equipment or people. Once in place, secure the cylinders in an upright position to prevent tipping or falling. Lastly, inspect the valve, look for signs of damage, and always ensure the valve is free from oil and grease. Many shops have multiple gases on site. Some of the common gases used with oxyfuel cutting and heating include oxygen, acetylene, propane and natural gas, and propylene. Because each gas has its own safety precautions, properly identify any gas before using it. Remember the triangle of combustion? Oxygen is one of the components. Let's talk about storing oxygen. Well, oxygen comes in many containers. It can be a compressed cylinder, it can be a bundle of those cylinders together, sometimes called a bank or a six pack or 12 pack. It'll come, it can also come in a liquid container which would be liquid oxygen and it can be portable. It'll come in pipelines, it can come in tube trailers. Mm. Uh, you can also come in a large bulk tank, much like you'll see at the hospital. And the biggest mistake is to use oxygen in the place of compressed air. You never want to do this because it could create a fire hazard. Some of the areas oxygen gets misused most often include using oxygen with pneumatic tools or using oxygen to blow dust off your clothing or your work area or using oxygen as ventilation in a place of error. Let's stress this safety point again. Never, ever use oxygen in place of air. Now let's discuss fuel gases, which are another component in the triangle of combustion. The most widely used fuel gas is acetylene. Other fuels are commonly referred to as alternate fuels. These include LP gases, or liquefied petroleum gases, which include propane, propylene, and butane. They also include compressed gases, such as natural gas and methane. The first thing to know about acetylene is that the basic structure of an acetylene cylinder is very different from other cylinders. The cylinder contains a porous mass, which is saturated with liquid acetone. The acetylene gas is then pumped into the cylinder and absorbed into the acetone. As you use the gas, it's released from the acetone. Because of its nature, there are several important safety considerations specific to acetylene. Your first consideration is always use and store the acetylene cylinder in an upright position. And remember, never use acetylene above 15 pounds pressure. Acetylene will have a tendency to disassociate above 15 psi and can cause a chemical reaction. That's why on all of the acetylene regulators, you notice a red line at 15 pounds pressure. The withdrawal rate is really important too. You're right, Ken, it is. It's very important. You can only withdraw one-seventh of the cylinder volume. 
For example, this particular cylinder has 280 cubic feet in it, so mm -hmm. what I would do is divide that by seven, giving me 40 usable cubic feet per hour of gas. Remember, never use more than one-seventh of the cylinder volume. Remember these four safety facts about acetylene. Always secure acetylene cylinders in the upright position. Never use acetylene above 15 PSI. Never exceed the one-seventh withdrawal rate rule. And never transfer acetylene into any other type of cylinder or storage container. Alternate fuels include natural gas and propane, as well as propylene. Natural gas and propane are colorless and odorless gases. So that they can be detected by smell, gas producers add mercaptan, which gives off a rotten egg smell. Propane is available in cylinders of various sizes, all the way up to large outside bulk storage. Unlike acetylene, these cylinders are shells only. Propylene is a colorless, highly flammable gas and has an odor similar to garlic. It's marketed under dozens of brand names, many of which have additives. Alternate fuels do not have the pressure limitations, withdrawal rate issues, or upright storage requirements associated with acetylene. If you need more detailed information about gases or cylinders, contact your local gas supplier. Safety standards clearly state that pressure-reducing regulators shall be used only for the gas and pressures for which they are labeled. Because different gases have different volume and pressure requirements, manufacturers engineer regulators for specific gases. For instance, Victor Edge regulators are color-coded and labeled for easy identification. Green for oxygen, red for acetylene, orange for LP gases, such as propane and propylene, gray for carbon dioxide, black for inert gases, such as argon and nitrogen, and yellow for air. Before we get into the procedure for installing regulators and hoses, remember this critical fact. Pure oxygen can reduce the kindling temperature of petroleum-based lubricants to room temperature, leading to violent combustion. Because of this, Never lubricate any component of an oxy fuel system. If you encounter oil or grease, stop. Call your welding supply distributor or other qualified service personnel and have them inspect and clean the parts. Your first safety check is to be sure that all the valves, threads, and seats are free of oil and dirt. Inspect the fittings, making sure they're not dinged up or damaged in any way. We'll do this on both the cylinders and the regulators. Now on the regulator, if the nut on this regulator does not match the fitting on the cylinder, it means you've got the wrong regulator. You need to find the correct one because you never want to change the fittings on a regulator. Before we attach these regulators, there's one good safety process I want you to follow for sure. Always stand to the side of the cylinder and clear the front of them. What we're going to do is crack this just a little bit and close her back off. But what has happened is I've cleared this valve assembly of all combustibles or any contaminants. I'll do the same for the fuel gas and shut her back off. Now we're ready to attach the regulators. As we install the regulators, be sure to use the right tool. If an open-ended wrench, a crescent wrench will work as well but never use a pliers or a pipe wrench. Always use the right tool for the job. Now we're ready to install the hose. Keep in mind that there's three grades of hose available. There's an R grade and an RM grade. Those are used for acetylene. There's also a T grade, which is used for any fuel gas and is the only grade that's allowable for alternate fuel. Take a look at the hose and inspect it. You notice that the nuts on this, they're a little bit different. The acetylene hose, which is typically red, will have a groove across the nut, which indicates left-hand threads. The oxygen hose, which is typically green, will not have that groove because it's a right-hand thread. And inspect the hose. Make sure there's no oil and grease, as always, and give it a good check to make sure there's no cracks anywhere in the system. 
if you find cracks or you find some oil or grease or you see some damage in the hose, change it. Do not use the hose. Now it's time to attach the hose. Gas hoses need purging to remove any potential contaminants that could have entered the system during manufacturing since the last time they were used or during prolonged storage. This contamination, if not removed, could be forced into your equipment and potentially cause clogging, failure, or provide a source of combustion. However, before you can purge the hose, first open the gas cylinders using these specific techniques. We'll first start with the oxygen. One of the things to remember is make sure that the oxygen knob and the acetylene knob are backed out all the way. Then you want to make sure that you're standing with the oxygen valve between you and the regulator. Open it up slowly. Once it's stabilized, then you want to open it all the way. The oxygen cylinder valve is designed to seal in the fully open and the fully closed position. Now we'll repeat this with some differences on the acetylene. Again, stand to the side and open it slowly. Now we only want to open this about three quarter to one full turn. And the only reason behind that is in case of an emergency downstream, I can get over here and shut this off quickly. Now to purge a hose, turn in the adjusting knob to about five PSI and allow it to flow for a few seconds. Depending on the length of hose, that time may vary and back out the adjusting knob after you've allowed adequate flow and repeat the process for the other hose. These safety basics are worth repeating. Never use a regulator or hose other than for its intended gas. Check with the current regulations if you have any questions. Get in the habit of inspecting all fittings and connections. Always, always ensure that they're free of oil, grease, and dirt. Slowly crack cylinder valves and allow pressure to stabilize before opening further. When opening a cylinder, be sure to stand on the side opposite the valve. Always purge cylinder valves and hoses to remove contaminants. Never open an acetylene valve more than one turn. Leave any tools needed to operate the valve in place, which will help with quick shutoff should you need it. Before looking closer at torch handles, we need to explain a few terms and understand some of the hazards associated with oxy-fuel equipment. The terms are reverse flow, flashback, backfire, and sustained backfire. Reverse flow is when either the oxygen enters the fuel gas side of the system or the fuel gas enters the oxygen side of the system. This occurs when there's a restriction of one of the gases or an imbalance of pressure. This can be caused by a clogged or blocked tip or allowing one of your cylinders to run out of gas. If a reverse flow condition exists, a flashback can occur. Flashback is the return of a flame through the torch into the hose and even into the regulator. It could potentially reach the cylinder. This condition could cause an explosion anywhere within the system. Flashback arresters are designed to prevent the flame from traveling beyond the point of the arrestor. Flashback arresters contain a sintered filter, which prevents a flame from passing through the filter element. Backfire is the return of a flame back into the torch, which produces a popping sound. The flame will either extinguish or reignite at the tip. This is normally the result of accidentally bumping the tip against the workpiece, operating the tip too close to the workpiece, or allowing the tip to become overheated. The last event is a sustained backfire. This is when a backfire occurs and continues burning in the torch. This condition may be accompanied by a popping sound, followed by a continuous whistling or hissing sound. Some of the causes for this are improperly maintained equipment overheating of the equipment, or improper pressure settings for the equipment being used. This is a typical...